Hi, my name is Kendall Donaldson from the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute, and I'm very privileged to be here today with three wonderful clinicians and friends, and we're going to be speaking about emerging concepts in the diagnosis and treatment of ocular surface disease in the female patient. I wanted to begin by introducing my guests, Elizabeth Yu, who practices in Norfolk, Virginia, an expert in cornea refractive disease and certainly ocular surface disease that we're going to be addressing today. And we have Neta Shami right here from LA, uh, California, so also practices cornea external disease and a specialist in ocular surface disease. And Priya Gupta from a Duke Eye Center in North Carolina, where she runs the ocular surface center there. So we have excellent uh, clinicians here, and I'm hoping to pick your brains today. We're going to be talking about how ocular surface disease affects women, the diagnosis, and the treatment of these patients. You know, certainly women make up a large part of my practice. And as we look at our practices in general, we'll talk a little bit about that. But it's interesting, you know, most Medicare patients, about 56%, I was looking through some of the data, but about 56% of the patients in Medicare are women. Um, many of our ocular surface disease patients are women because of some of the other systemic diseases, some of the other elective procedures that we have. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what our practice composition is and um, how our male to female ratio is and why this is such an issue in female patients. Liz, you want to start out a little bit telling us about your practice? Sure. Um, I mean, I know that we are looking at kind of um you know, we think of dry eye disease and what our practice setting looks like. And I think even in the 10 years that I've been practicing, it certainly has encompassed a younger age group and definitely can involve both genders. We know so much more about dry eye now, both diagnostically and from a therapeutic standpoint and what the ideology looks like. So whereas before I would say it was kind of my older patient, but now I certainly can appreciate the fact that patients are coming in um, and, and they're coming in for second and third opinions because they're gaming and, and they're on the computers all the time. and and so it's become where the technologies and different modern risk factors, um, dry eye is becoming much more ubiquitous, but I can definitely appreciate the fact that there is a gender predilection for different reasons um, for uh, greater women um, who are in the, the office setting for that. Yeah, and Netta, are you finding that to be the case in your practice? And what do you think the male-female distribution is as far as ocular surface disease and what's the composition of, of your practice? Absolutely, um, I have, like you all do, uh, surgical and a medical type of practice where at least half of my practice is very surgical. And in the past, it used to be that the dry eye part of your practice was the non-surgical. And what I'm seeing now is that whether it's we're paying more attention or patients are more educated or a little bit of both, really dry eyes is encompassing the entirety of our practice, all our surgical patients as well as our non-surgical. Uh, as far as female-male ratio, you know, it's interesting because maybe because we, we are paying more attention to the dry eyes, I am seeing it about half and half uh, in my male patients as well as my female patients. I feel like my female patients are coming in with the complaints that are more classic for dry eyes versus my male patients, I have to convince them that they have dry <laughs> eyes. <laughs> um, and you know, they may, not, they may be coming in and, and going straight for, I, you know, I think I have cataracts, I need cataract surgery, and I don't want to generalize, but that's the, t the kind of reaction I'm getting, whereas my female patients are coming in, having those symptoms of, you know, I'm having blurring or burning, and, and, and are describing the symptoms differently than the men. I think females are much higher user utilizers of the medical system, first of all. And actually, in, um, if you look at the population 85 and up, there are twice as many women as there are men. So those older patients, you know, certainly many more women. You know, actually, Priya, in your, in your practice, you have an ocular surface disease that's sort of separate from your main clinic. And how, how does that work as far as your uh, ocular surface that seeps into your regular clinic, maybe with surgical patients? And what, what's that look like? Yeah, um, so at an academic institution, you know you're kind of a referral center. And so um, there's no shortage of patients that suffer from dry eye, both male and female. And um, a lot of, you know, what, what I'm seeing is there's a, a large overlap. And so, you know, somebody might come in to see me for a dry eye evaluation, um, but they also have cataracts and they have other ocular diseases going on. And so it's really, you know, one of the shifts that I think I've seen in the last number of years is that we're looking at the entire patient, no matter what they're coming in for. And I think that because we have a lot of better tools today to diagnose dry eye, we can pick it up easier. We, um, and it's on our mind, you know, we're, we're paying attention, certainly in our pre-surgical patients, we have um, high expectations, high demands, but to me, it's really um, 
something that I see more often, you know, so it's more prevalent in our population today, but I think we're also better at finding it. So that's part of what accounts for the high incidence. And I think our female patients really have some different concerns when they come into our office. And there are some special issues that are related to women, such as cosmetics and some of the elective things that women tend to do at a higher incidence, I would say, than, than male patients. Uh, maybe, Liz, we could get back to you and maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're seeing that is you know, just unique issues with women. Um, well, okay, so from a therapeutic standpoint, you know, a lot of female patients, rightfully so, not a whole lot of makeup is necessarily waterproof, but the installation of even artificial lubrication, um, that can cause your makeup to run, and it can be a nuisance because it blurs the vision, and so there are some specific concerns, and, and of course, with regards to cosmetic surgery and any kind of lid surgery that might be done, either functionally or from a cosmetic standpoint, exposure can be an issue, but certainly even the morphologic change, the architectural change that can occur from having uh, the, the lid margins adjusted or, or uh, the tarsus adjusted or the, the, the tissue underneath, that can all affect from a mechanical standpoint and exposure standpoint and increase the incidence of dry disease. And sometimes, you know, it can be fairly devastating. I mean, I've seen corneal tattoo patients. Let me tell you, my biography has really just changed the way that I am understanding uh, the evolution and the cause of dry disease. And corneal tattoos, you know, uh, not, I'm sorry, not corneal tattoos, but um, I went tattoos, it can actually just completely obliterate your meibomian glands. And so these patients who otherwise would have been okay from an iatrogenic self-induced standpoint from vanity um, and for efficiency purposes, just so you don't have to wear eyeliner um, or do it every morning, but that can have some fairly significant sequelae and um, implications for the future. And so as clinicians, we have to recognize these gender specific issues are very important. Why? Because all of these patients are coming into our practice. So as a clinician, it doesn't matter um, what kind of practice we have, we're going to see these patients and we have to be aware, um, top of mind, about different causes um, and how to um, kind of address these more specifically. Liz, I think you bring a really good point up about um, eyelid surgery and eyelid position. Um, I think it's one of the most under-recognized or diagnosed things when you look at the dry eye patient. Um, blepharoplasty significant, significantly changes the blink um, and how the tear film is spread across the surface. A lot of these patients maybe weren't screened before they had blepharoplasty. You know, they're seeing a cosmetic surgeon, they're not necessarily always seeing an ophthalmologist, and they may have pre-existing lid margin disease. And so it just kind of compounds. And so I think it's, you know, something that everybody should be looking at, you know, whether it's looking for blepharoplasty scars or asking the patients, have you ever had any eyelid surgery? But you really have to pull that out of them, do. really tease yeah. that out of I them I think it's also times. important, yeah. uh, you know, in Los Angeles, we have a collection of, of uh, plastic surgeons and such all within a five mile radius. <laughs> and um, a few years ago, I was asked actually by the kind of the local ophthalmology meeting organizer if I would be uh, willing to present on dry eyes because they see so much of it. And I found that to be a wonderful opportunity to educate my colleagues who are at the helm of what we then see the sequela, right? So I really encourage ophthalmologists to partner with the um, plastic surgeons and, and, and cosmetic surgeons in their area and educate them the same way that we need to ed be educated of, uh, about our colleagues and you know non-ophthalmology practice, uh, practicing physicians and colleagues about things that may um, kind of be involving both our field as well as theirs, it's really important for us to educate them. And it was really great for me to present on the importance of screening before doing cosmetic Raising surgery. Awareness. And now, yes. you know, now I'm seeing patients prior to their blepharoplasties and prior to their cosmetic surgery screening for the dry eyes. Same goes with contact lens use. I think uh, that's the other thing is, you know, women are, um, we're, you know, we're more cognizant of, of cosmesis and such, and so we're probably more, uh, bigger users of, co of contact lenses. And screening is critical. A patient who, or someone who's starting contact lens use, they need to not just be screened for dry eyes, but educated about the symptoms of dry eyes so that when they start not being able to tolerate their contact lenses, they know that there's something going on, that they should go and get evaluated, and their lid margin should be evaluated. And, uh, tear osmolarities and um, you know, um, uh, see if they have any inflammatory byproducts in their tear film. Absolutely, you bring up a great point. Those contact lens wearers are often the people that go on to have LASIK and then they go on to have the lid procedure and so these things kind of cluster together and then it just compounds the problem so significantly. 
But actually, Neta, I was, I was interested to know, you know, I've, I've been in practice 13 years now since I finished fellowship, but it's, I never looked at the lids. You know, when I was in residency and fellowship, we didn't talk about any of this really. And it's interesting how things have evolved over the last decade, and particularly over the last five years. We've kind of had an explosion of awareness. And uh, what, what things have you noticed that have changed since you've been in practice? Yeah, I agree with you. I, I have, um, I graduated fellowship almost 15 years ago, uh, about 14 years ago, around the same time as you. And I agree with you. I think Schwimmers was our big, you know, <laughs> diagnostic test back then. That was it, and right? fluorescein that was staining it. And, and all yeah. the different types of staining. And we thought, wow, we're really advanced in this. I agree with you. I think we, we, our understanding was very limited that we thought it was only lacrimal insufficiency and we had no real appreciation of not just the meibomian glands, but also the mucin layer, the goblet cells. I mean, we knew the anatomical nature of the, of the ocular surface, but we didn't really understand the contributions to the tear film and the anatomy of the tear film. We didn't understand conjugalasis and how important that is. And the truth is, we understand it now better than we did then, but there's still a lot to be understood. I and mean, we understand, as Liz was saying, the meibomian glands are important. We now have imaging devices that we can look at them and if there's dropout or not. Or not. But do we really know what the natural progression of meibomian gland dropout is? Does it come back You know, if we treat? And these are things that I think, uh, with Priya, your work, and Liz, and all of us, I think paying attention to it, looking at our treatment modalities and how that changes the anatomy, we can then understand it better and be able to educate and, and empower our patients, not just feel empowered as physicians and clinicians ourselves, but really be able to talk it out with the patients. It's a lot more fun treating dry eyes now mm -hmm. than it was 13 years ago. Do you agree? It was really challenging because we didn't have the tools. Yeah. So Priya, can you just talk a little bit about the screening and diagnosis Absolutely. of these patients in your practice? Um, so when patients come in for um, with the dry eye, typical dry eye complaints, whether it's blurry vision, um, irritation, redness, um, it kind of triggers a protocol and our staff will, we typically do um, tear osmolarity testing, um, inflammatory testing, which is a measurement of the MMP9, and um, meibomian gland imaging. And so those three tests really help to kind of aid you in differential diagnosis, but also categorize your patient in terms of their severity um, if it truly is dry eye. As you all know, the masqueraders and dry eyes is a big, uh, a big thing, right? So not all patients with foreign body sensation, redness, irritation, or dry eye. Um, <clears throat> and really with these tests, it, it makes the diagnosis of dry eye so much easier um, for the clinician. And um, we're all scientists. We like objective data. We like ways of following patients over time. We like to know what's happening. And I think that was what was really frustrating for everybody, right? And you'd hear a dry eye patient, oh, great. You know, there's not much I can do for them, and they don't look that bad, right? So now we know it's not, you don't wait for the corneal staining. You don't wait for the meibomian glands to be notched and dragging posteriorly you yeah. can actually assess these things ahead of the disease. And that's really, to me, the key differentiator for being successful in your treatment. Yeah, I think you make a great point about the objective measures we're getting now that we have. We could share that with the patients. Patients love to see numbers. They love Absolutely. to see any kind of data. They love to see pictures, you know, any images. Um, Liz, what are you doing special in your in your practice? And I know you use a lot of imaging to, to help with these patients. We do, you know, I mean, just as, um, you know, my panelists were saying, you know, it's so true that our attention to the lid margin is much, much more acute now than it used to be. Um, the actual quality of the medium is very important and looking for signs of inflammation, which, you know, very commonly in the beginning of MGD, it's a mechanical cause. It is a congestion. It's a non-obvious MGD where inflammation may not not be the ideology. It's not necessarily primary rosacea blephritis, but we cannot forget the fact that we have to pay attention to that tear film too. There's so much of that that's going to, you know, give us insight into into the biofilm. If we're seeing the little suds, you know, that's a saponification that's occurring from the bacterial lipases. So it gives us something else in mind that we can think about because we want to also develop that. We know that lid margin flora can have its implications both in anterior as well as posterior blephritis. And so that should be top of mind as well to trigger how we can optimize the success in the treatment of our patients. Because yes, thermal pulsation is absolutely wonderful. It's also great to prime the patient because you want to make sure that whatever intervention that you are actually providing for that patient, that it really can provide a synergy for them. And then obviously in the, in the post-operative and uh, to make sure that there is a longevity to it, that there's some form of a lid hygiene that you can't continue. But that is why that initial 
initial examination and really paying a close attention to the quality, the structure, the architecture through imaging and even the tear foam and really focusing on that, the height to see if it is normal and the quality of that. Is, is there a lot of debris in it? Is there soap suds appearance in it? All that is going to be really important in that ocular surface exam because 80% of what we are seeing with dry eye, as Michael Lemp has demonstrated, really has an MGD component to it. Absolutely. And those images, when you show them to the patient, the patient can actually understand. They say, oh, that is the problem that I'm having. Yeah. And um, you know, they can appreciate that for the first time. And that helps to create a partnership, I think, between the physician and the patient. And it helps really with compliance. Uh, it's also so important for disease stratification. You know, we have so many great therapies for dry eye and MGD and for the longest time, we had no way to see if patients had gland atrophy. Mm -hmm. um, gland atrophy is, you know, something that they start. It starts from the base and then you know works its way up. So what we're seeing at the top is, you know, maybe just the residual of you know severe atrophy, or maybe there's normal anatomy and it's just congested. Um, so to me, it, that that myography has really helped me stratify. And, and kind of set patient expectations, right? And, and help them understand where they are in the disease. I think myography will also help us differentiate within the meibomian gland disease mm -hmm. entity, the different types, Absolutely. right? Because there's, as you said, there's congestion and then there's dropout. Mm -hmm. Does congestion lead to dropout? We don't know. And is it saponification, cases with saponification of bacterial overgrowth, do they then, are they the ones who have dropout? And these are things that I'm so excited because I think the next decade yeah, we'll be room. able to, you know, use the imaging devices we have, all the different diagnostic tools, you know, does MMP then lead to faster dropout? And things like this will really help us be able to target our treatment far better than we are now. We are much better now than we were 10 years ago. The other thing that's really uh, important, I think, with the imaging and the diagnostics is that we now have a lot of different treatments. And so I think, as you said, it'll stratify the patient into what category they fall into, but it also will, will let us go through that progression of treatment options in a way that we can start a treatment and, uh, at level A, you know, this is step A, and then we're going to have you come back and then we'll see, are you responding based on these tests, based on the OSDI, you know, questionnaire, are your symptoms improved? And if not, then we'll either add on to this treatment regimen or we'll, you know, depending on what you're doing, or should we just change shifts? And that's really fun. And, and, and that's why you can have a whole dry eye center of excellence and really have your you know majority of your practice be based on that if you really are thoughtful about it and patients are grateful yeah, they really when are. you are you know thoughtful about how you approach them so how do you quickly and efficiently screen these patients so we've been doing an OSDI we do um, in uh, MMP9 testing and we do a tear osbillary on all of our ocular surface patients as well as all of our pre-op patients and I was wondering what you guys are doing because we could spend all day testing these patients so how do you do it efficiently that you can incorporate it into your clinic yeah so um, clinic efficiencies we have to temper all of that with also the costs and, and, and the time involved because a dry evaluation especially with the more conventional test with Shermer's one uncomfortable two it can be a long time because you're seeing these patients patients pre-contact and then you're seeing the patients again after the tremors. Well, fortunately, because of the different point of care tests, as you mentioned, um, and the different objective data that we can now see, it provides us with one greater insight to kind of the disease level that they're at. And I'll provide an example of that. And then, and then three, kind of just as you said, a thoughtful, more customized approach. I think the tear osmolarity in my experience over the last five, six years, I have learned so much about dry eye disease and the, the, the role of tear osmolarity. So before I would get this normal value and I'd say to myself, that's not a normal eye, I can see staining. But what I appreciated over time, and I think Chris Starr just published something along these lines, is that when you have a normal tear osmolarity, it means that there is an ocular surface disease component. It's just not necessarily that chronic, progressive, classic dry eye that you're thinking about. I'm thinking about early MGD. I'm thinking about allergic conjunctivitis. I'm thinking about, you know, um, maybe an earlier response to treatment. Prior, and, and so they are starting to normalize that tear osmolarity and other mechanical causes like conjunctivoclasis, but it helps me to very quickly align that. And then looking at the myography and quickly saying, okay, are, is there mild, moderate, or severe dropout? That coupled together then helps me decide, okay, is my first line of therapy going to be more of a lid margin intervention? Do I need to quiesce them? 
Do I need to actually acutely quiet down that flare up? Are they best um, indicated here to put on a steroid? Because you know you don't want to necessarily use a steroid as a first line treatment, but but these are some thought processes, and and certainly um, having the point of care diagnostics does make the dry eye diagnosis an easier one to make, and it creates a more streamlined approach to how I take care of these patients in that discussion. And I think a lot of times we also have to look back at their systemic diseases. You know, sometimes I forget to look, you know, at, at what else is going on in their lives. You know, the medicines they're on, the underlying diseases, especially in women with all the inflammatory autoimmune issues that they can have, and then glaucoma drops and other things that they might be putting in their eyes. You know, we sometimes overlook some of that. So now I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the therapeutics, how we start with a baseline regimen for these patients, whether they come in complaining of ocular surface disease or they're a pre-op patient and we're trying to prepare them for surgery. I was hoping uh, maybe Priya could start with that. Yeah. You know, what's um, your baseline regimen? For taking Just care of starting them. with a new patient, you know, what, what's Absolutely. your maintenance? So, you know, once you've taken your diagnostic tests and narrowed down where your patient falls in, you know, do they have MGD, do they have eyelid abnormalities, poor blink reflex, um, I really I try to first figure out, you know, is there a lot of inflammation? If there's inflammation, you're, you're required to treat that. And, and a lot of inflammation comes from, you know, bacterial overgrowth on the eyelid, the presence of bacteria. And so I think um, lid cleaning um, and lid hygiene is really important. Um, we've incorporated um, the Avanova cleanser into our practice. It's something that um, we actually write prescriptions for it or we sell it out of our office as well, um, just for patient convenience. But um, it's just used twice a day. Patients, especially those with rosacea that tend to have that bacterial overgrowth as kind of one of their root problems. We know that rosacea skin types like um, bacteria, like the all that extra um, uh, oil that's there. And so I, I find that it's particularly helpful in those patients to really help kind of calm down that propensity towards one, forming these biofilms along the eyelid, but two, to maybe you know calm some of that underlying inflammation. Yeah, we've been using a lot of Avanova too. And I know, Liz, you had mentioned that you were using it in your practice and you, Same. You as well. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really, really made really a big helpful. difference for our patients. I've actually had patients, my rosacea patients, use it yeah, on, on their, their skin, yeah. on their yeah. face. Yeah. And yeah. it's been really no, it's effective. It's really been a nice I tool. I think, especially as you said, if you're looking at the lid margin and there's any anterior blepharitis, any crusting of the lashes, and if there's any saponification, if there's meibomian gland disease, it's really important to have that cleansing and, and improve the biofilm, most definitely. Well, and also in our surgical patients. Yes. I mean, it, this is one area where you know infection is something that we all take very seriously yes. and anything that we can be doing to help lower those bacterial counts so that you know you're not putting your patients at um, as high risk i think is really a no-brainer 100 percent in my patients where i'm particularly concerned about the anterior blepharitis because we know that right at the root of the base of the lashes you're going to have a lot of that bacterial overgrowth i mean if you are going to start and and our number one regimen is going to be doing hypochlorous acid topically for those patients you don't want to do it and then send them right into surgery because you're maybe potentially exacerbating a problem because you're releasing everything, right? So for those patients, I am scheduling their surgery for four to six out, six weeks out, but I'm instituting the topical hypochlorous acid from the very get-go in order to make sure that we really cleanse and sterilize the lid margin in preparation for surgery. And that is a very nice way of um, kind of preparing that patient. And that's the key to screening all these patients. So we're, we're screening all these patients you know, when they come in for their consultation, which would be four to six weeks generally before surgery. And then we can start them on the Avanova, you know, the lubricant drops if they need you know, a steroid or, you know, restasis or Zydra or something like that to help pre-treat before we make our measurements. Of course, we know Alice Apatropoulos had a wonderful um, uh, publication this past year that showed us how our measurements for our IOL calculations really depend on that ocular surface. So pre-treating is so essential. Now, how about heat treatments and things like that? How are you using that uh, in your practice? Yeah, I mean, the heat treatments, I think we still need some, a better tool for home treatment. Uh, we obviously have, you know, Lipaflow in the office if, if need be, but the, the challenge with the heat, as, as you know, the muscle layer blocks the heat uh, penetration to the meibomian glands, and so it's difficult to really tell the patient how do you uh, apply heat in a way that would be effective. Do we really know? My, my uh, old-fashioned technique of just hard-boiled egg with the shell on and have this, <laughs> you know, use it to not just heat but massage. Um, that's the challenge. I think that's a real challenge. Um, I don't know what your tools are, or a teaspoon and a hot 
water and then use we, the back of the teaspoon. We really too. like the brooder masks. Um, the brooder those mask, are, those yeah. are, I mean, they're amazing patients. Yeah, we're using those a lot they too. They absolutely love them. Um, the, they're super easy to use. They hold the heat well. And um, it's something you can carry in your office or patients can, can order them. But it, it's, I mean, it's a very We actually have easy. a two-page printout that goes along with that, how to apply your heat, how yeah. to use your mask and all of that. And I actually have someone who demonstrates that to the patient in the office, which I find really helpful. Once they have it demonstrated, they do can you, do that do at have home. It? So we don't have it in the office. We recommend the patients to get it themselves. Um, and they've actually loved it. So we start off by demonstrating in the office with just kind of, <laughs> well, we should actually have it in the office. Yeah. And just, I, I mean, I think that patients love getting stuff in the office kind of that one-stop shopping i mean i know i love amazon and one click yes. <laughs> so that's why we do it um but i think that i mean it's certainly convenience um, yeah we have a lot of products in our office too but liz you had told me about an interesting idea that you had online and you've instituted in your practice can you tell us a little bit about that oh sure um so i mean some of this can be overwhelming right so you're talking about the the average um, clinician who is saying, you know what, I am going to embrace and take care of more dry eye patients, but where do I start? What's the process? And now adding a retail store, it can be overwhelming. I mean, certainly getting um, kind of a championed education uh, through something like Dry Eye University, I mean, can be very helpful uh, for that clinician to get um, a thought process on, on how to, you yourself, uh, really harness and champion um, taking care of your dry eye patients appropriately. But running a retail store can be a little bit challenging. Um, we do have one, but what we found is sometimes it's not easy for our patients to come in to get their refills for their omega-3 supplements or whatnot. So we actually have an online dry eye store really easy. It's not necessarily something that we manage, but it is through a third party company, but it goes through our website in itself and patients can go on there and with a certain amount, the shipping is free, but you know, I, I don't know if it's two day shipping now. <laughs> it's not prime style. Are you trying to, are you trying to compete with Amazon? <laughs> no, well, I'm not. And we, Virginia Eye Consultants Liz, is not competing with Amazon. Let me just let it be known. But, um, but you know, but that is one way of being able to institute and kind of bring in some of the retail products that you can offer to your patients without necessarily the upfront capital investment into it. Well, I think it. the benefit of doing that too um, is that the patient leaves with treatment options because as we know, the suggestions you make can kind of fall off the, uh, the recommendation as the patient goes and starts their life and they forget what you had <laughs> recommended. So if you have a, a package, a survival package for them uh, right at the outset, then they can start the treatment right away. Yeah. So I just wanted to kind of wrap things up now. Um, I, have, I was going to ask each of you to provide a clinical pearl in treating ocular surface disease in these uh, challenging patients. I'll start with Liz. Sure. So dry eye disease is an exploding field. Um, it can almost seem confusing because there are so many different diagnostics and therapeutics, things that we've all discussed, and, and we do things differently. But what's actually, what I've learned is that because of the different objective diagnostics that we have and the, the expanse of therapeutics, the treatment and management of our dry eye disease patients has become a more simplified process. You just need to educate yourself and your staff on how to identify the di different types of disease that exist and embrace the treatment options that are available. Excellent. Okay. Netta? I think um, it's important to educate yourself and the staff, but also your patient, and really get your patient's buy-in. Make sure that from the outset it's, it's communicated with the patient that this is a, it's a natural or it's a progressive disease and that, that we need to catch it early and that inflammation is at, at its crux, that we really need to get to the inflammation, but this may only be the first step and that the patient should not be expecting this quick response and then I'm treated, that they need to understand that this, like diabetes, like any other kind of chronic disease, has a progression and that you are invested in the, in the health of their ocular surface. And have, you know, what I love to tell my patients is that I'm here through the whole journey for you. And that my hope is that the journey will kind of slow down in a sense, that we won't let you get past this point and we're gonna get you back to more normal state. And, and when they get that reassurance from you that you're with them along the way, that this is not a nuisance, this is not a low back pain for you where you're, you, know, you just wanna deal with it and be done with it, that you really wanna kind of carry them through the whole process and you know, throw the treatment options to them and then create a treatment plan that's customized to their disease they then are your partner and you're their partner in their treatment journey. 
That's a great point. You know, I think these patients are, have sort of a personality that's associated with chronic disease, whether it's cancer or anything that has been dealt with chronically. And a lot of times they become a victim and they just lose hope after a while. So a lot of times we have to spend the time to turn them around and create that therapeutic partnership. And the trust. Yeah, right. and the trust. Yeah. That's terrific. And Priya? Well, mine is easy. It's um, don't make dry eye hard and really pay attention to the anatomy. So if you see the gland obstruction, treat that. If you see irregularities in the conjunctiva, treat that. And, and, and go back to kind of the root of, you know, how we were all trained. Look for the abnormality. And if you can treat that structure um, and make it functional again, your patient's going to be happy. It's terrific. All, all those pearls are wonderful. You know, I think we really are lucky to be practicing in 2017 when we're almost kind of spoiled because we have all these uh, interesting and, and helpful devices that help us both diagnose and treat dry eye disease. And we have so many options for our patients now that uh, we didn't have 10 years ago. So this has really been a changing, evolving field and it's just getting better and better with more options for patients, more diagnostic and therapeutic devices. So we're very lucky. Um, thank you all so much for being here today and taking time out of your busy schedule to discuss this important problem in women. But certainly all of these things apply to other groups of, of patients, including our male patients, our children. Um, it really can affect almost anyone. So I also want to thank our sponsors uh, for the program today. That includes Tier Lab, Tier Science, Bruder, Avanova, Dry Eye University, and Ophthalmology Management. So thank you all. Thank you.